From the tiny seed of a tree, plants can grow to the biggest organism on the planet and survive for more than 2,000 years. The most amazing thing about that feat is that they never move. This tree had been living in the same place to become a 4.2 million pound giant and more than 370 feet tall, living through rain and drought, heat and cold, even forest fires. Dr. Joel Birkin, professor of environmental engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology. As an environmental engineer, I'm very interested in preventing human exposure to pollutants and preventing disease that those chemicals may cause. And we've come to understand that plants can play an important role in that setting. Plants are very interesting. They're place bound. So they grow in one location and they interact with the soil, the groundwater, the air around them. And from that, they're really masters of mass transfer. They harvest from those surroundings, all the carbon, all the water, all the nutrients they need. And we've also understood that chemicals in that surrounding, in the soil and the groundwater and in the air around them, also can accumulate in those plant tissues. And by understanding those transfer processes that lead to chemicals moving into plants from their surroundings, that if we sample those plants, we're actually sampling those surroundings. And maybe the exposure was years before or days before. And from understanding that chemical exposure to plant pathway, we can also then understand the chemical exposure to human pathway. And by finding those chemicals early and remediating them, we can prevent human exposure and contaminant uh, diseases that we see in the human body. So by understanding the chemical interactions, we really have a potential to sample almost anywhere on the globe, especially the places that we inhabit, because we generally enjoy having plants around us and we landscape with them. So by doing so, we actually introduce a biosentinel to our setting. And by sampling that plant, we may better understand how we're exposed to chemicals. And by understanding that exposure, we can prevent it. And getting back to being an environmental engineer, preventing disease is really what I want to be doing. Let's take a closer look at how terrestrial plants do these remarkable feats. The energy of the sun and atmosphere and a lack of moisture in the air cause evaporation from the leaves, and they draw that moisture from the soil around their roots. For plant growth, the important function is that plants use the water supplied for the photosynthesis process, combining the atmospheric CO2 with the water, H2O, to make organic carbon all by using the power of sunlight, which is also stored in the new organic carbon that is the food for the plant, and oxygen is the byproduct necessary for life on Earth. So all the mass of a plant primarily originated as CO2 gas in the atmosphere and H2O below the soil using the power of the sun. This is the source of organic carbon on terrestrial Earth, in other words, the base of our entire food chain. So plants act as the connection between groundwater and the atmosphere, again, all powered by the sun and wind. This process of moving water to the atmosphere is called transpiration. As the roots have an intimate contact with the subsurface and plants have a large surface area of roots to harvest this water, often the water is as moisture and water vapor and not a pool of water below the water table. This large network of roots acts as a huge harvesting and transport network to collect the water and nutrients even when they're at a low concentration. Many of the roots are in the form of root hairs that are only a couple of cells in diameter. This water transport also allows the roots to harvest the nutrients from the soil as well, even when there are hardly any nutrients. Plants generally require large amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from their soil, along with many other micronutrients, although many have the ability to colonize soils with low nutrients by being very efficient at harvesting and utilizing the rare resources available. This intimate contact and the energy of transpiration also allows plants to act as a collector of pollutant atoms and molecules that have been leaked into the groundwater and be pulled with the flow of water to the roots. Some of these fugitive pollutants can then be degraded in the root zone called the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is where organic carbon from the roots and the nutrients and water from the soil meet. As a result of this meeting point for life's essential components, 
The rhizosphere is the most biologically active zone of the soil, where microbes take advantage of these ideal and rather consistent living conditions. This microbial community can also degrade many pollutants. This process is called rhizodegradation. As there are thousands of pollutants with different chemical forms, not all pollutants degrade, and some have the ability to enter the plant, crossing the root's membrane and remaining in the flow that enters the plants. As these root membranes are the barriers between the environment and the food chain for life on Earth, we are quite interested in this process. We may not know exactly the, the full chemical profile, but we can get an insight to what is below ground. It's very obscured to try and see what's below the surface, but yet that's what plants do. As masters of mass transfer, their roots are in that subsurface and they're pulling those pollutants to above ground for us. We just have to understand how to take those plant samples and analyze yep. them and really get the knowledge that we want. Senior tree diameter we'll get in a minute. Just a minute. This is where Dr. Birkin and researchers at Missouri S&T have developed techniques to detect and measure these pollutants, even at low levels. By detecting these pollutants in the plant tissues, the pollutant distribution in the subsurface can be delineated and mapped. This has developed into the new methods of subsurface chemical detection termed phytoforensics by Dr. Birkin's team. And there is our groundwater chemistry pulled up by the tree. As plants occupy the same part of the environment as humans and are also living, breathing organisms, they are surrogates for potential human exposure. Chemicals can enter the human body from drinking them in water or from the compounds being in the air we breathe. Chemicals in the air and dust around us enter the body by absorbing into our skin or being inhaled and entering the blood through our lungs. For compounds that can exist as a vapor, they can enter the basement of the home from the subsurface. This is called vapor intrusion. This is not preemptively regulated nor routinely checked in individual homes. Exposure can be long-lasting, as often fugitive chemicals in the groundwater are not known and the entry into the homes can go undetected. As we spend an average of 20 plus hours a day indoors, indoor air quality is a large factor in human health and potential pollutant exposure. As the plants actively pull in pollutants by translating atmospheric energy into transpiration and water movement, they're acting similar to our homes, as plants occupy the same soil layers and act similarly to the basements. We test the plants and can forensically assess the potential for the people in the home near the tree to be exposed without ever entering the home. So in our ongoing work, we want to better understand what chemical properties control or limit the plant uptake of pollutants and then we can predict which of the thousands of chemicals that are produced may readily enter the plants. This has great benefit in looking at which organic pollutants may easily enter plant tissues relating for food security as well. As we have a shorter water cycle and directly irrigate crops with treated wastewater, we should understand what levels of contaminants are safe in that water. We also have gained understanding by comparing our findings to human uptake studies, properties allowing plant uptake, and similar to those that control transmembrane migration in humans. Basically, what chemicals can move from our intestines to our bloodstream and then potentially into our organs? We have identified clear similarities, which is not surprising since many biological membranes are similar. We have looked at the similarities of the human blood-brain barrier and note similarities there as well. One big difference is that roots can be damaged or leaky and the plant can survive. So we need to better understand these controlling properties and the root physiology and fundamental chemical structure. So overall, we hope to bring better understanding of how we can use plants in multiple ways to protect human health. We know we can find fugitive pollutants in our biosphere, and with our current efforts, we may help in preventing food contamination and in the future, design safer chemicals for our planet. Every elementary school kid understands that plants utilize water and that by relating those processes and our love of plant system, 
it's very easy to relate some of these very complex ideas of how a chemical and its properties will move through a plant membrane and move with the water stream in the plant or not. Plants are the crossroads of our nitrogen, carbon, water, and our cycles that bring solar energy in to combine carbon dioxide and water into all the food we need. And I hope that at least gives some glimmer of where we could go forward with understanding our globe and our planet and all these complex systems just through something as simple as a plant.